Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC201, the course on Christian history and missions. Uh, today, we're going to discuss on the revival in our day. It's more of discussion. All that we studied in uh, in the past classes, today we can discuss on our understanding how important is revival and what are the uh, what are the uh, what are the criteria? What are certain things that we need to keep in mind for us to expect a revival in our time? So even before we could uh, go ahead with that last class, I requested you all to have a study on the evangelist. Have a study on the evangelist. How was their uh, ministry and function in their ministry would anyone would like to uh, uh, share on them i'll just share the screen so if you would like to share on any of the evangelists please unmute your mic and you can share yeah on the list of uh, evangelists it can be anyone so you would like uh, if you would like to unmute and share how did they function how was their ministry what was the impact of their ministry among the people uh, you can unmute and share just in few words yeah anyone from the class we all know of them we all know about their ministry how effective it was just share about any of the uh, any of the evangelists from the list Lyndon, Anita, Isaac, anyone, you all can just unmute and share about these evangelists that you know of and how, what was the ministry and what was the impact of the ministry that you know of, Lubega. We all know of Catherine Kuhlman, isn't it? Anyone can share about Catherine Kuhlman? Jeffina, would you like to share about any of these evangelists? Um, I actually chose Benny Hinbuster. Okay, please go ahead. That's okay. Yeah, so... <clears throat> Uh, Benny Hinn is known for uh, uh, Pastor Benny Hinn is known for his miracle crusades, actually. Uh, and uh, there is a program called "This Is Your Day." Uh, it is one of the world's most watched uh, Christian program. Uh, it is seen almost in uh, two hundred countries every day. And so he he was born in December 3, 1952, in the port city of Jaffa in Israel. And he, in 1968, uh, after the Six Day War, he moved with his uh, family to Canada. In February 1972, uh, his life took an entirely new meaning uh, because that's when he surrendered his heart and life to jesus uh, as his high school friends prayed with him uh, so soon after that he was called to minister the gospel in april 1974 he received a vision of people falling into a roaring uh, in one he heard these words like if you do not preach every soul that falls will be your responsibility so these are the words that he heard uh, from god and that actually uh, inspired him that actually motivated him to uh, preach the gospel in december 7 1974 uh, after his 22nd birthday uh, he first stood uh, behind a pulpit uh, to preach the gospel um, from that moment he started uh, speaking fearlessly about uh, the great things that he did uh, over 45 years uh, he was a statesman he was an author and more uh, 
above all he's a telecaster that show uh, that he did and he's also a bridge builder and he's known as an uh, evangelist and he has preached mostly through the television to billions of people and one thing that really inspired me is that uh, the words that he heard it also inspired me like if you do not preach the gospel every soul that falls will be uh, your responsibility this is something that he heard from god but when i read this about him it also inspired me like yeah many souls are lost many people around us are lost and it is my responsibility sometimes that i should actually go and preach sometimes we are so caught up into the busy schedule that we forget that uh, we should actually go and evangelize to the many people or in front of us and uh, we are losing souls and those things inspired me yeah yes yes thank you jeffina for sharing any one from the class like john georgia paul success you can pick on any of the topic that you know of you can just share a few words what you know about the person and the ministry that they did and how was what was the impact through the ministry to the people um i'll speak about catherine kulman uh, briefly sure. Um, yes Catherine Kulman um uh, started ministering in um in the early 1900s so she was born in 1907 and uh so few things which we have heard about Catherine Kulman is she is um so much into the power of the holy spirit and there are even some videos available in youtube talking about how um impact fully she uh, operates in the power of the holy spirit um one of the things which i personally have noticed is the way she speaks is very um, very different uh, than modern day preachings it is uh, very very powerful um uh, it's a little bit dramatic as well and it's it's interesting to see uh but what we see through her ministry is um uh, she's uh, she's been more into the uh healing deliverance miracles um so when she starts ministering the holy spirit just takes over and um, you see a lot of miracles happening through uh maybe the uh, uh, administration of the word of god at that moment and we, you would just see that uh, many people are getting healed because of the presence of god so he gave she gave a lot of importance to the presence of the holy spirit and also the intimacy of the holy spirit um and that also impacted uh, uh, pastor benihin uh, when he started um, ministering um so yes. during uh, catherine kulman's ministry a lot of people um you know used to come uh, and she they used to get uh, healed especially people uh, living out of wheelchairs walking for time uh, in their lives and one thing i've heard uh, about catherine kulman is uh, she carried a lot of presence of god with her so whenever she walked down the streets people used to repent of their sins people used to um, turn uh, you know how god people used to get, uh, get converted of their uh, you know convicted of their sins and uh, the power of uh, holy spirit was so much over her and which is uh, is this the manifestation of the power of the holy spirit yes yes thank you john for sharing and catherine Anyone else? Zeli, would you like to share? Lyndon, Leah. Praise Lord, Pastor. Praise the Lord, Lyndon. Pastor, has anyone chosen the DJ Sinagra? No, don't worry. You don't have to worry about it. Anyone chose? You just share on any of the person, any of the evangelists that is listed there. Just feel free. We have few more minutes. We may take two more persons. That's it. Go ahead, Lyndon. Okay, so uh, I'm not a native of Kerala, but I'm, I'm settled in Chennai for a very long time. So I, I've uh, known uh, Brother DJ's Dinagrin's ministry for a very long time, and at least I've heard, uh, you know, from several God's people you know, sharing his testimony. So uh, Brother DJ's Dinagrin uh, hails from a very poor background, and um, he was a wonderful servant of God. He had a zeal. He had a zeal for Christ, and he did. uh you know travel across the globe uh you know sharing the gospel and we did uh build uh 
a prayer tower and his ministry's name was uh, Jesus Calls. And it, it, it still is, uh, uh, it, uh, the ministry still continues and it's, it's uh, taken over by his son, uh, Reverend Dr. Paul Dinagrin. But uh, to talk about uh, uh, DGS Dinagrin in particular, there was a point in time because of poverty, because of uh, you know uh, various uh, pressures or you know situations. Uh, there was a time when he, he decided to uh, you now give away his life to commit suicide, and at that particular point in time, is uh, one of his uncles, uh, you know, shared with him a Bible or you know God's word, and at that particular point in time, he, he got saved, and um, he, he was touched and com or comforted by the word, and he was, uh, uh, you know, wh while he was working for, I guess it was Indian Overseas Bank or uh, Indian Bank, I don't recall. But he was working in a bank in, in, a, in a decent uh, job or decent position. But at the same time, he was also serving God, ministering, evangelizing. Uh, but in one of the interviews which he had with another servant of God, he did mention that uh, for uh, approximately seven years or so, he was into village ministries and you know uh, evangelizing in, in market areas and open areas. Uh, and till the time he received the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that's when you know his, his ministry really flourished. And you know it branched so out. Carpenter and so uh, uh, I mean, the, he also shares uh, an encounter which he had with uh, Jesus when he was praying, when he was uh, broken, and he was you know, praying in his room where you know there was uh, a light which which came out of nowhere, and you know he happened to see the presence of God, he was able to talk to God and where he did ask God for all the uh, the, the gift of the spirits and you know, uh, he claims he was blessed with all the, all the spirits and uh, you know, while he talks, while he addresses to the community, to the people, in all these messages we can you know, uh, clearly see the compassion that he had uh, for the people and you know, the grace of God was fully abounded or surrounded him, and yeah, he was a wonderful uh, minister of God. He, he had several trials and tribulations during his lifespan. Uh, uh, you know, that includes uh, the toll he had on his body. Uh, every for every meeting, he you know he, he comes you know well dressed. He comes you know uh, hale and healthy. But uh, after end of the meeting, or you know once once the message gets over and once once. Uh, he, he, you know, starts praying for all the people who come to the pulpit or the podium. By the time he leaves the stage, literally there will be two people carrying him to his car. And yeah, he, he travels several places across uh, uh, Tamil Nadu, across India, and across overseas as well. And um, and uh, yeah, he, he had several. I mean, he had a huge toll on his body at one particular point because uh, at least until. Uh, early or mid 70s he was still working in a bank and he was also ministering uh you know uh, serving god's word uh and only after which you know he decided to commit himself for full-time ministry but uh during that course of time he also had this his, uh, he, he, his family were traveling in a car and they met with an accident as his daughter uh, you know, died on the spot, and it ha it also had a terrible blow on his uh, family, on his spiritual life. But uh, there were God's servants around him to comfort him by God's word, and eventually, yeah, he continued with his ministry. And throughout uh, his his lifespan, he, he, he bore witness uh, to the God who called him, and he was truthful for for his calling. And uh, I, I don't think there's any who would. Uh, really comment or you know uh, would even sarcastically comment about brother DJ's Dinagar or his ministry at least until his, his lifespan. He lived a, a, a you know a, a life full of witness and he was full of grace and compassion and yeah, he was very kind hearted and he, he, he guided a lot of or rather inspired a lot of uh, you know uh, then existing and the, the upcoming uh, evangelists and ministers of God. And it was indeed a blessing for, uh, you know, Chennai, where he hails from, at least, uh, you know, for a, for a major part of his life was in Chennai. And there's a lot of churches, a lot of uh, ministers of God who are 
inspired of them. And yeah, that's about it. I, I, I mean, I, I just said whatever comes to my mind, I didn't you know, prepare myself, so that's about it. Thank you. No worry. Thank you. Thank you, London, for you know, sharing on Dr. Deejas Tanakaran briefly. Is there anyone who would like to share? If not, we can move on to the classes. Is there anyone here in the class who would like to share? Brother Isaac, Lubeka, Abu Bakr, is there anyone you would like to share on the evangelist or the list of evangelists? Yes. Yes, brother. Go ahead, please. I'm not, not too prepared, but I want to share a little bit about uh, Billy Graham. Yes. Franklin Billy Graham, born November 7, 1918, and died February 21. 2018, was an American evangelist and an ordained Southern Baptist minister who became well known, <coughs> excuse me, internationally in the late 1940s. He was a prominent evangelist Christian figure and according to a biographer, was among the most influential Christian leaders of the 20th century. Graham had large indoor and outdoor rallies with sermons that were broadcast on radio and television, with some still being rebroadcast into the 21st century. In his six decades on television, Graham hosted annual crusades, evangelistic campaigns, that ran from 1947 until his retirement in 2005. He also hosted the radio show, Hour of Decision, from 1950 to 1954. He repeated he was against racial segregation and insisted on racial integration for his revivals and crusades, starting in 1953. He later invited Martin Luther King Jr. to preach jointly at a revival in New York City in 1957. In addition to his religious aims, he helped shape the worldwide view of huge numbers of people who came from different backgrounds, leading them to find a relationship between the Bible and contemporary secular viewpoints. According to his website, Graham preached to live audiences of 210 million people in more than 185 countries and territories through various meetings including BMS, World Mission, and Global Mission. Graham was particularly close to Dwight D. Ensignore, Lyndon B. Johnson, and Richard Nixon. He was also lifelong friends with Robert Schupfer, another televangelist, and the founding pastor of Crystal Cathedral, who Graham talked into starting his own television ministry. Graham's evangelism was appreciated as he encouraged those mainline Protestants who were converted to his evangelical message to remain within or return to their mainline Christian churches, rather. Despite his early suspicious and apprehension common against contemporary evangelical Protestants toward Catholicism, Graham eventually developed amicable ties with many American Catholic church figures and later encouraged unity between Catholics and Protestants. Graham operated a variety of media and publishing outlets According to his laugh, more than two point, sorry, more than 3.2 million people have responded to his invitation 
at Billy Graham Crusade to accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior. Graham estimated lifetime audiences, including radio and television broadcast, toppled 2 billion by 2008. As a result of his crusade, Billy Graham preached the gospel to more people in person than anyone in the history of Christianity. Graham was, sorry, Graham was on record so, to have written more books in the middle of the 60s. He, was, he had become the great laminator by them and the presence conferred status. Graham writes that by the middle 1960, he had become the great, by then his presence conferred status on president, acceptability on wars, shame on racial prejudices, desirability or decency, dishonor or insistency, and prestige on the civil events. Billy Graham was married to Ruth Bell. He had five children and he passed away as stated above in, he passed away on February 21, 2018. That's all I can get, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Isaac. Thank you so much. So we will move on to our class. We're going to look into revival in our day. So let's take turns, OK? Let's take turn to discuss on what is actually expected from us to expect a revival. What is needed from our side to expect a revival? So the first, we're going to look into the time for latter rain, as stated in Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18 it says and it shall come to pass in the last days says god that i will pour out my spirit on all flesh so that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and on all my men servants and all my maid servants, I pour out my spirit in those days they shall prophesy. So we see that how God has chosen certain time to pour out a spirit on everyone. So we see that uh, this uh, this quotation is this uh, scripture is also been used in the book of Joel. And Peter also explains that what these curious onlookers are looking for. When the Holy Spirit is poured upon all the people, you see in the Old Testament, you see Holy Spirit was given for certain people for certain time and he, he, he went back. But in the New Testament, it is not like that. The Holy Spirit has been poured upon people and all flesh. So this was a very glorious emphasis which took place on the day of Pentecost. So there had been no provision or no promise of, of abiding in the Old Testament, abiding of the Holy Spirit in a person in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it is a new covenant where Jesus said, when I go, I send you a comforter who will abide with you forever. So here we have the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who abides within us forever. He is not a visitor anymore, but he is abiding with us forever. So whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Pete, we see that Peter also used this passage from the book of Joel for an evangelistic purpose, right? Because he wants to explain the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which was meant by God, is now offering salvation to each of us who 
believe on Jesus. So to whoever calls on the name of the Lord, whether they are Jew or Gentile, to receive the Spirit of the Lord. And also in the book of James, chapter 5, verse 7 to 8. James, chapter 5, verse 7 to 8. We read it. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmers wait for the previous fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. So you also be patient. So be established, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So let me see here. James is trying to uh, uh, address the issue of the ultimate judgment before us, which is a remark about the ungodly rich and their destiny. So now he calls uh, all the believers to be patiently endure until the coming of the Lord. So we see that he also illustrates, he illustrates uh, between a farmer and field. So he says, a farmer does not give up on his crops, does not come to harvest immediately. So what he does, he keeps working on it. He keeps working on his field to, see, to find why this crop cannot, uh, you know, uh, uh, is not healing or why this crop is not growing. He tries to work on it. And you see, eventually, even we as believers must work hard and exercise the patient of endurance. So even when the harvest day seems very far or harvest is not seen at hand, but when we don't give up and when we work hard, eventually we will see the crop yielding the fruit, just like how the farmer works hard to see the crop grow and bear fruit, the same manner you and I should have, carry this endurance, carry this heart of patience so that we don't give up in the process. So when we think about it and wait and uh, wait with endurance in our life and you see, just like the farmer, we will bear fruit. So in this passage, we see uh, James, James bringing a comparison, illustrating between a farmer and the harvest. So he says, uh, the farmer waits with a reasonable hope and expectation of a reward. So can we also wait with a, a hope and expectation of a reward and by not giving up and doing what is good that we are doing? The farmer, uh, uh, James says, the farmer waits for a long time with endurance. Can we also do that in our work, in expecting a revival, in expecting a change, in expecting a transformation in our ministry, in our workplace, or within us as well? Sometimes, even when we look at us, we need to be patient and be growing in the Lord and see Lord move and work in us as we spend time studying His Word and moving in His Spirit. Just like how the farmer, he works, he waits working all the while and he waits depending on things um, out of his own power, with his own eye, keeping his eyesight on heaven. He's saying, Lord, I've sown a seed. I've, I'm, I'm doing all that is needed for the seed to give birth and grow. Now, it's only the Lord who can make this seed grow and become a tree. You got it? Look at the faith of a farmer. He's taken a small seed and in his mind, he's having a tree in the picture. In his mind, he expects the fruits to come out of the single seed. And with so much of hope, he's sowing that seed into the ground and, you know, putting the fertilizer and watering it and expecting the seed to grow, become a big tree and bear fruit. If a farmer can put that hope on a single seed, how much you and I can put hope on the word of God, which bears much better fruit in us. 
if a farmer can picture a tree with fruit, how much you and I can uh, can imagine and hope for, like every promise that God has given about us and about our ministry, how much you and I can trust the word of God and wait with endurance, with patience, with a heart of expectancy, saying, Lord, I know your word is a miracle seed which went which can grow and bear much fruit. So here we see he waits and encouraged by the value of the harvest. He is also encouraged to work hard and see the harvest. He's not going to give up. He's aware of how, how it works in each season. And as he waits, the time goes and it becomes more important when there's less time. He wants to see the tree grow. He wants to see the seed grow. Bear much fruit. In a similar manner, God is asking you and I to wait upon him on every promise that God has given us with an expectant heart. So the need for revival is for us, especially for us in this season, you see we have uh, we have a very modern technology around us. We have various tools and methodologies available for us, which is making us easy to minister, which is making us easy to be equipped in the word. But what is more needed for the revival? For us to do that work, just like how the farmer works hard, toils hard in the field, we need to toil hard in the world. Let's meditate the word. Jo Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says, let the word be in your heart and in your mind. And when we meditate on it, you see the success of it. So we need to meditate. How do we meditate? Put on the word into your heart. Because a word carries power when the word is sown in our heart. And meditate on it. When we pray, when we pray over it, you see the spirit of the Lord who is within us. He will teach us, he will move us, and he will also help us to pray for the need of revival. When we read in the uh, in Rome in the book of Romans chapter eight, uh, later part from twenty six onwards, I guess when we read, you see how the spirit of the Lord groans within us, and He prays certain prayer that would be acceptable by the Lord Himself. So He teaches us how to pray. So we need to ignite this passion for God and His Word for His Spirit. You see how the Spirit of the Lord can move things in and through us. We see Him move from strength to strength, glory to glory, and be the kind of people that God intends us to be. We also see as we move in this realm, we see every meeting, every church, every prayer meeting, however you are conducting, you see how people have been attracted to the word that you're sharing. Why? Because you're sharing on the name of Jesus. Just like how uh, John shared in the class, like Catherine Kuhlman carried the presence of God within her. Even when she walked on the road, people were convicted of their sin. Now, maybe when she's walking, she's not preaching and walking. But the very presence of her is convicting the people of their sin. The presence of God. So we... You and I should yearn more for the presence of God. We should yearn more that, Lord, we will be the carrier of your presence. This is not something that only happened during Catherine Kuhlman's time, but this happened in our early church days. We see Peter and uh, Paul carry the presence of God. When they walked on the street, the very shadow of Paul brought healing to people, brought deliverance. They've just passed over his handkerchief and the sick were healed. So what happened? The presence of God was so strong in them. Now, how did they get this presence of God within them? Because the amount of time they spent in the Word, the amount of time they spent with the Lord in prayer. And now the Spirit of the Lord is no more a visitor. He's abiding in us. You see there's an increased presence of the scripture also says wherever Jesus went, there was a huge crowd.
crowd following Jesus. Now, there were no advertisement, there was no Facebook, there was no Instagram, there was no Google ads, there was nothing, no advertisement. But the presence of God, Jesus was fully God. So this attracted the people. Wherever Jesus went, there was a huge crowd following him. And wherever the presence of God is, there's manifestation of his glory. That is healing, deliverance, signs, wonders, miracles. You know, it was, it was, it was falling with the presence of God. So you and I, when we pray, when we, when we meditate on the word of God, and when we carry the presence of God, it is automatically we can be we can go with an expected heart, like just as how the farmer expects a huge harvest. Our church will grow, our ministry will grow. Uh, it will impact the area. It will impact the city. It will impact the nation and the nation. Just like how we studied in the previous chapters, like few people two or three people or there were maximum five people gathered in a room earnestly prayed with one accord for revival and you see the revival broke and this revival was like a fire that caught the world so this didn't happen later it can also happen in our time in our time through us in us so can we pray? Can we have that fire within us so that we can pray saying, Lord, I want to truly impact the world. Lord, as your word says, I want to be that salt and the light that brings a transformation to the city, to the state, to the country and to the nations where we are. So when we have this fire, you see the fire spread. So there may be certain hindrance that can stop. But then we need to uh, intently watch what is that hindrance that is stopping us from moving into a realm of revival. We need to intentionally see to it that we remove it, uproot it from us, from ourselves, from our ministry, from our church, out. So what are those? What are those simple things that may hinder a revival? One of them could be ignorance. If we do not know what God has in store for each of us, for our ministry, for our church, then we are ignorant of what God is doing. So we need to fast and pray, Lord, reveal your plan to me so that I may not be ignorant of what is expected from me so that I can move in that path. Second is misunderstanding. Sometimes we have our own uh, skewed picture of what revival mean, what a revival outbreak mean. And we try to look for those things. But by doing that, we're putting God into a box. Who are we to put God into a box? In the book of Acts itself, the Spirit of the Lord moved in different ways. That's how he does. Even when we studied the early revivalists, each revival was so very different. The Spirit of the Lord works different. We cannot put God into a box. Just expect, uh, I mean, ask God, God, you move in your own way. So how God desires, let him move in us, in our church, in our ministry, in his own way. And as we expect for revival, we also, we also need to pay attention about the sin and worldliness. Is there anything that is creeping into us in our ministry, in our, in our church? So that we don't live a compromised life. Because this is very important. Revival does not interest, uh, you know, um, in this area, sin and worldliness. If we remove sin and worldliness from us, you see how the Lord can move in and through us. And we also need to look into for complaints. Sometimes we are very complacent about our spiritual things. We are satisfied, we are content where we are. But this has not been ex expected from us. God is asking us to, uh, you know, uh, carry out the spirit of revival by being hunger for more of Him, because God responds to those who are hunger and thirsty for more of Him. In 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 the Gospel of Matthew, chapter five, verse six, He says, "Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled." That they shall be filled. One of the beatitudes, and also there's another beatitude that says, "Blessed are the poor in spirit." But theirs is the 
kingdom of God. Poor in spirit, thirsting, yearning for more of God's spirit. You see, God gives the kingdom of God to that person. So we need to be, we should not be complacent, but then yearning for more of God. Lethargy. It's simply a spiritual laziness. So we should not, uh, you know, uh, we should not be, uh, we should not be spiritually lazy in our life. That we need to make every effort to pray. The minute we feel that way is when we need to put an effort to read the word, to pray, to seek more of God in this season, because this may hinder the revival or it may hinder the plan of God that God wants to do in our life. Resistance to change. We know that pursuing revival will require that we must be willing to put aside uh, our well thought a plan programs or strategies rely entirely on the Holy Spirit to guide us. But revival can be disrupted because revival is something very different. We allow the Lord to move in that place. So let's not uh, stick to one particular plan, but allow the Lord to move so that uh, resistance to change is very open in us, allowing the Lord to work. Lord, you do as you will, because Lord understands better each of us, our people, a city, our nation, and accordingly, Lord will move. So this is something that we need to do. And also, we need to be focused on the credit. We should not be taking the credit for ourselves. We need to be open minds and give complete credit to God, give the glory to God. We, we cannot take the glory of God for us, OK? So give the glory to God. What belongs to God, give it to God. God. So we need to earnestly pray for revival. And uh, some of the char characteristics of uh, 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 genuine revival or visitation are something that cannot be manufactured, something that we cannot manufacture. We need to exalt Jesus in our ministry and not any individual. And we also see that there is no there is a proclamation of a sound doctrine. So we need to be prepared with the word and share the word in the right way. Because we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we see that, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayer. So we see that the gospel of Jesus Christ was proclaimed clearly of the cross, of the work that Jesus did on the cross, of his resurrection and of his uh, seated at the right hand of God. And with that, with the, the message of gospel, they called for the a call of repentance so that we can live a life that is pleasing God, that may glorify God in our life. And, and, and what is the other thing that we can focus during the time of revival? Or how we can know uh, if there's if there's a revival happening? What are the certain things that we need to genuinely see for? These are the things that is of God. These are the things that is moving God. That is, along with Jesus' name being exalted, and along with that, uh, you know, the proclamation of sound doctrine, we need to see there is unity in the spirit. There's unity in the spirit because at the heart of those being used there must be a strong sense of brotherly love not just in word but in deed and in truth so we must be uh, flowing together with a competition without any competition sorry. without any uh, competition or without any kind of pride in ourselves but giving glory to God and allowing the Lord the spirit of the Lord to move and have this unity in the fellowship of the spirit and with that we also see that people are brought together in intimacy in wholeness and in Christ likeness the revival should bring everyone into love of God into the Christ likeness. And the outcome of the revival should be the lasting fruit that would transform the lives of each other. 
So we see the people, there are some people who, who visited certain revivals and out of that revival, they bear, the ministries were birthed. We see Nikki Campbell who attended a revival and he birthed, <clears throat> okay, in one of many churches touched by Toronto, revival was Holy Trinity Church in Brompton, London, where, which was led by Nikki Campbell, who was uh, who's also known as the best leaders of Alpha. Now, this Alpha ministry course that he founded has become an evangelistic tool which is reaching throughout the world. We also see Heidi Baker ministry. What happened at Toronto, Ronald and Heidi Baker had been a missionary over a decade. And in 1995, they moved to Mozambique as a missionary and a responsibility of over 300 children who had called her Mama Ida. And you see how their life was transformed, how the Lord moved supernatural providence and there's a fruit in this ministry people have been raised dead uh, dead were raised back to life lives were transformed people are encountering jesus there's uh, the blind is able to see the deaf is able to hear the presence of god is bringing the healing deliverance and there are signs wonders and miracles that is happening among the people so what we can have can we have uh, the visitation of God? Yes. Even in our time, we can have the visitation of God. We need to get ourselves prepared for that. So with that, um, we I will stop this class because it's time up. Okay, We'll end this class with a prayer and we can continue from where we stopped in the next class. Dear God, we thank you that you are working and moving in us. We pray that you will prepare our heart and mind so that we can discipline ourselves and look up to you for a revival, Lord. We look up to you for the revival to be birthed in, our, in and through us, in our church, in our city, O oh Father. Lord, we pray that you will move in and through us, Lord. Thank you, Father, for doing it. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, class, for joining in. God bless. See you all in the next class. Thank you. Thank you. God bless.